You know what else is fun to share? Your ambivalent feelings about Billy Dee Williams and your love for Mahogany, Diana Ross's 1975 camp classic about an ambitious fashion designer from Chicago who faces every woman's eternal dilemma. Should I be an internationally famous supermodel or settle for being a sexy Chicago community organizer's bae? I'm Evie Jones, and this is the very first episode of No Tea for the Fever, the podcast that celebrates, elevates, and occasionally side-eyes some of the world's most captivating, sometimes infuriating, films by and about Black women. Getting word now that Beyonce isn't the only Black celebrity. Some are saying Kerry Washington may also be Black. No, I can't be. She's on ABC. I don't understand. How can they be Black? They're women. Obviously, our first episode had to be about Mahogany, because this iconic film has everything, including Diana Ross's star turn as Tracy Chambers, an ambitious wannabe fashion designer who sashays her way to Italy, where she becomes a world-famous supermodel named after a type of lumber. Billy Dee Williams, as a race-conscious, proto-Barack Obama Chicago community organizer seeking his own chocolate June Cleaver. Anthony Perkins, snarling his way through the role of a sexually confused fashion photographer with a Pygmalion complex and a touch of jungle fever. And clothing that's either completely gorgeous or so garish even Carrie Bradshaw would put it on punishment. Mahogany, which was released in 1975, and holy crap am I old, was directed by Motown founder and mocha mogul Barry Gordy. Gordy, already the film's producer, fired British director Tony Richardson for, I guess, maybe not being the most insightful choice to helm a movie about a black woman from the inner city. Its stars, Ross and Williams, were fresh off the success of Lady Sings the Blues, and I guess the time was right for Gordy to shepherd Ross's career from supreme singer to major movie star. Now, Mahogany is either a goddamn classic or a bad movie we love to hate on and love, depending on who you're talking to. It has a lot to say about, yes, love, fashion, race, misogyny, Beauty, loneliness, the delicate flower that is masculinity, the fluidity of desire, and whether even Billy Dee Williams has enough swag to carry off a man purse. I instinctively knew that Wendy Staten, my favorite lawyer turned actor, would have a lot to say about all of the above and damn did I pick the right person. Wendy is an actor, model, and voiceover artist based in Philadelphia and Los Angeles, just like all those other bi-coastal people whose Twitter bios make me weak with jealousy. Wendy is smart, funny, and insightful as hell, and over the course of our Mahogany Gap Fest, one of us fell even more deeply in love with the movie, and one of us fell increasingly some kind of way about whether Mahogany was really one of cinema's great black love stories or... mm, Spoiler alert, I think Billy Dee Williams Bryan was all wrong for Diana Ross's Tracy and only loved her when she put him first. Also, I apparently have a thing for Caribbean men. And Wendy really thinks there should be a mahogany too, Electric Boogaloo. So we don't know what's going to happen. Is Does he going to win? Does Billy Dee have to be in it though? Is he going to win? I know. Back then, Billy Dee now is not the Billy Dee back then. Well, this was Billy D before Lando, yes, uh, way Calrissian, before Lando. and Star Wars, before Colt 45, yes, yes. before the domestic Eating, yeah, battery charges. That's what I'm saying. Like, you can't fairly judge him. And I just, because my mom was like, a huge, like, I only saw Empire Strikes Back. That's the only Star Wars I saw <laughs> in the movie. Uh-huh. Because my mom, and I ended up going to the arcade of Plymouth Mean Mall, because my mom wanted to see Billy D. Williams. Well, it's so interesting because I, you know, remember at the time while this movie was coming out, and they'd already been in um, Lady Lady Sings the Blues Mm -hmm. together, which was more successful than this movie at the Um, time, but I find kind of like with the passage of time, Mahogany is the one that people remember and are all all up in. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, he, I remember it was him and Robert Redford. 
mm-hmm. like those were, yeah. you know, and Billy was for colored women yeah. of all colors. Yeah. And Robert was for white women. And I remember being a little like preteen going, damn, are these our choices? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> he was hot. And to me, he was like a rougher version of like the classy Sidney Poitier without being too, like, you know what I mean? I don't I, know. I know. I mean, I was thinking like at the time, I was really like, I really need to hear more from Sidney and Harry Belafonte. And I was thinking about this last night. And I was like, wait, did I just have a thing for Caribbean now? Mm, you know, maybe. Meta Caribbean. <laughs> maybe. I know I do. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, Billy just never did it for me then. Yeah. But I guess I'm not basing it on me then. I'm basing it on my mother and the black women. Like, black women of a certain age loved Billy. He would not be Billy And D. still, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So, I think, and the way, I mean, to me, he wasn't boring. I thought he was very charismatic in this movie. Like, I was like, oh my God, that's the guy my mom loved. Like, I yeah. get it. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like. Mm-hmm. And he had swag. He was like, he would beat the guys up in a minute. You know, anybody who likes that little thug life, like, that was it. Uh-huh. And yet could charm you. And I don't know. I I would have, I can't love him in this movie because he, my thing is, I'm not down with somebody who only loves you when it's convenient. Mm-hmm. You know, like, again, to take it back with Chris Rock, he would say, like, but you have to love the say crush. she isn't loving him only when it's convenient? It was inconvenient for her to, like, work on his campaign and, mm-hmm. like, make herself second. And he didn't really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. He was just kind of like, thanks. He mm-hmm. And here's some more shit for you to right, do. Right, right. Um, so it's interesting, you know, watching the movie again because he clearly cared about her. Um, but I just feel like not enough. Mm-hmm. And, and again, I feel like it's the time. I don't know. The time. I, it's the time, but I also think of, you know, a lot of my secondary. girlfriends today. Yeah. Like, a we'll lot of it. women, especially black women, but women of all colors, like, and I always think, damn, this is why I'm single, but are are kind of dealing with the, baby, I'm doing this for us. I don't say especially women of color. I think, I think other women are willing to sacrifice more, but we just don't hear about it. Like, I know yeah. so many women who... Mm-hmm. pay all the bills and they're white mm-hmm. and their husband's home they're mm-hmm. just more accepting of that for some reason home playing world of warcraft and you know with the dog with mm-hmm. a full bladder who hasn't been walked inexplicably I, know, I find the more you know <laughs> other people it's, we're all the same I refuse to take on that burden that is just us because yeah. especially the older I get the more I'm like even my mother like I feel like she's the strongest woman I know mm-hmm. like my and my father really encouraged strong women. He loved her. She was very strong, even though she stayed at home. But they ended up having businesses together. He respected her. She ran the money in the household. Mm. But, um, and he was odd in that he could, he wanted a strong woman, but he also wanted to be the breadwinner and protect her. Like, he still felt the role of the male. Mm-hmm. Even though she could go out and be fabulous, too. Like, he just was like, you I'm know, not opposed to that dichotomy, Wendy. Me neither. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. So this is, again, why I'm single. However, <laughs> my mother, when I, when I was in law school and I had the chance to go abroad for free to this, I was like, I'm either going to go to South Africa or Australia. I got the grant, you know, whatever it was, fellowship. And my mom's like, oh, you're never going to leave, you know, the boyfriend I was dating at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was like, huh? Like, what? That was never a thought for me. And he was Caribbean. I was like, what? Somebody seems to be forgetting about mine. I can't forget about something that never existed, Tracy. 
you think it's about time you faced up to it? Forget you, Brian. Tracy, six o'clock, please. I think it's okay to make that decision if you own it and embrace it. Um, you know, again, with my single ass, like... I'm never down with the, baby, I'm doing this for mm -hmm. us. And so basically the next 20 years, you have to toe the line and support my dream because it's for us. But did you see Nina Simone documentary? <sighs> What's it called? What, I read Nina? her um, autobiography and I haven't really recovered for that, from that. It's I'm not going to so lie. It's so hard. But her husband gave up his career as a police officer sergeant and became like the first, like got her out there, even though... It was a horrible, abusive relationship, but that's he... a big even though. That's a big asterisk. No, but I'm just. I, <laughs> we don't know what domestic violence, whatever could have happened with these two, Tracy and whatever. But I'm just saying, a Ooh, man has think? sac. We don't know. Mm -hmm. Like that wasn't part of the story. Yeah, but I hope it wasn't. It, a lot of times, it takes one person to sacrifice. Yeah. Do you know? No matter, it's something you're gonna have to sacrifice. You aren't always gonna be on the same page. I think. Yeah, definitely. Be, definitely. I, it's the lopsidedness of it. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't really see Brian Billy D giving up a lot. Brian right. Billy Dillon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still like the photographer. <laughs> Yeah, he wasn't giving up much. No, he wasn't. Um, and it's that more than anything. I definitely think it's got to be a give and take, but anytime it's just more like a man taking, mm -hmm. especially from a black woman, I'm just like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You know, I get my resting bitch face. Yeah. Sadly, there's no known cure for resting bitch face. Scientists haven't even bothered to conduct clinical trials. But you don't have to be Madame Curie or a fool for love to appreciate the on-screen chemistry between Ross and Williams and Mahogany, or the fact that 41 years later, it's still challenging to get a movie made that's both glamorous and, I think this might be the technical term, blackity black black. That theme song has to go, though, Oscar nomination or not. And he had humor. He had a they had such humor. good chemistry. The chemistry I, was off. Why did they make more movies together? I'm confused, but I guess maybe her singing. Because then she started doing the disco and Diana. Mm. Uh, and I'm not mad at her for that. No, me neither. Are, <laughs> me neither. Those were good times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know. I think that's the first album I bought. Oh, man. On Columbia House, when I ordered them. I think the first album, I the first record... That, yeah, back record. when they were still called yeah, records, yeah, and it was a forty-five, was like reunited. And Peaches and her, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, That's a good song. But this came out. It was maybe like three years after "Lady Sings the Blues," mm -hmm. and this was like a huge. The idea that it would be so black, blackity black, yeah, and unapologetically yes. so, and be so over the top, yeah, like. We know Hollywood, everybody's always really down for, like, oh, she's strung out on drugs. Right, nitty gritty Claudette. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. I think it, this I was Claudette a much. Was strung out on drugs, but all the kids. Oh, Claudine. Claudine. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Though I would see Claudette in a second. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this was a bigger, a much bigger mm -hmm. leap because mm -hmm. of the glamour. Yes. You know, yes. like. She and that's what I'm saying. She could have easily went from Chicago. First of all, Chicago has a fabulous fashion industry. But remember the scene where she's meeting with the garment district guy and he right, says right. something like, Chicago is not where you start, it's where you end exactly. up. Exactly. And I was just like, damn. Like when you haven't made it. Right. So they could have had her go to New York because you were talking about Paris. So I was just mm -hmm. like, Italy is a pretty big deal. Italy is a huge deal. And for me, that whole movie is summed up in that taxi ride that she's taken when she first gets there from Chicago yeah, yeah, yeah. and she like escaped and they're playing the theme from Mahogany when aren't they playing the theme from Mahogany <laughs> <laughs> he was like this will be an Oscar nominated song if nothing and else and it was so and it was so <laughs> but you know I like, didn't really thought that she did shove that song down her throat until I was reading the end and I read I was like yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's omnipresent, and it's just it lends the whole movie this air of like melancholy. Yes, like that. I again, I'm not really mad at, but it's like mm -hmm. it's not an up. Even the joyous yeah, scenes are not yeah. as. 
mm-hmm. joyous as they could be because that thing. But that just... was also it was great not to have like buffoonery comedy. Like it was a complex. I am so upset that people like have bad things to say about mahogany. Well, I that's mean, the thing is that this... feminism. I get that, right? But just as a movie, I thought it was a fantastic movie. They, it gets a lot of um, drama. Uh, like I love about Mommy the Dearest. script. Yeah, Mommy Dearest had a lot of serious things to say. Yeah. I don't care about the coat hangers. Yeah. Like, there's Although a I, whole that was amazing too, though. <laughs> completely amazing. And but she was over the top. So why can't we have a black movie like that? Like, oh no, they don't all have to be like you said about drugs or about comedy, strictly comedy. You are still listening to No Tea for the Fever, and we're still talking mahogany. Now, you'll never hear Mahogany described as a rom-com, especially since some of the comps seem to be a little on the dark side, like a rape attempt you see Tracy Jive talk her way out of while the credits are still rolling. Mahogany will also never pass the Bechdel test, because this is a movie where Tracy's primary interactions are with three men who seem to be playing some kind of international version of marry, fuck, kill. But that's, I guess, kind of okay. Because in addition to Billy Dee Williams, Mahogany gave us Anthony Psycho Perkins as Sean McAvoy, Tracy's fashion photographer Svengali. And man, does he chew the scenery in this movie like it's a juicy steak. Perkins, Sean McAvoy, and Billy Dee's Brian are radiating so much twitchy male angst about Mahogany, the woman, not the movie, that whole sections of the movie could be hashtag masculinity so fragile. And Wendy and I were really here for it, whether it involved fly Italian leather jackets or sexually confused mentors who couldn't quite rise to the occasion. They're hot with the little leather jacket. The little leather jacket. Her, uh, in um, Italy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This. Yeah, I was watching the part where they're in Italy. He flies over mm-hmm. to surprise her after they haven't seen each other, and I guess there's yeah, no sense of time in this out. movie. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm going to guess it was at least a year. Yeah. Um, and she's buying him a suit. Yes. And he's just really... He can't eat pasta. Yeah. But I was really thinking about, like, how a lot of this movie is about masculinity and, like, um, frayed masculinity because mm-hmm. he's really a little mortified that she's, right. one, able to buy him the suit, right. that it costs so much. Right. He can't afford it. You know, he keeps joking about it. Um, and then after they buy the suit and they're walking down this gorgeous Italian street, he says, oh, I feel like such a sissy. And I, because he's carrying basically right. like a man purse. Right. 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 <laughs> and still rocking it. Yeah. But clearly I'm about Dee. it. Because he's Billy Dee Williams. With the perm hair. With the perm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know. This is like maybe, I guess, 20 minutes, a half hour after that aborted. Um, there's that whole scene where Tracy is just lying back on these gorgeous pillows talking to Sean McAvoy, the photographer. Okay. And she says, you know, Sean, I owe you everything. Yeah, yeah. And, and where he couldn't get it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. there's that whole interlude where she says that and um, he immediately leans in to kiss her. Yeah. And it's really awkward because... You know, I think there are all different kinds of flavors of masculinity, but there's the his doesn't match her <laughs> in yeah. some weird way. So I just cringe so much through that. And she says, Sean, that's not who we are. Yeah. This is this isn't us. And you don't have to prove something to her. Right. And he goes off. She yeah. he's like, prove you know. And as it turns out, he can't prove it. Um but I was also thinking there's something really sad about that where if a man can't get it up, it's over. Mm. Like, there's nothing else you can do. Well, me, see, I feel like if they had a sex scene with Billy D and he couldn't get it up, it would not have been over. Right. I think she felt, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I think she felt obligated. To oh. Tony mm-hmm. Perkins. I can't even say his real name. Because mm-hmm. Sean McAvoy. I, not his real, I say his real name, not his character, Sean. I feel like she was just being nice and feeling like, okay, I'll help him out since I owe him everything. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's over when that's all you think you're trying to do and you can't get it. I was like, okay, well, I tried. Next. Yeah, I felt that was more, yeah, you're right. But I was thinking it's a 
it's a comment on him. Like that's all he felt he had to offer. It wasn't just like, well, this isn't working, but I'm still, you're still going to leave happy. Uh. You know, it was clearly like there was silence. Well, that, yeah, but that comment. I don't know. I th- maybe I, I've led a privileged life where yeah. it's all good. <laughs> no, yeah. If that ever happens, it's probably very emasculating. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's ever right after, like, immediately. You know, like, there's a lot of conjoling and saying, it's okay, baby. Da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. You had a late night. You know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> But not usually sexuality, but in this case, it was definitely like, yeah, stay in your lane and accept your lane, and I'll stay in my lane, and that's just not who we are. Yeah, I mean, also there was just something really maternal about the way yeah that whole scene went down. Like one, he's just blatantly suckling in a way that he yeah. thinks is sexy, and she's just kind of tapping his head like, right, you like, would a baby so or a gay. toddler, just accept it. <laughs> It's okay. I love you. Yes. And I feel like she was taking taking some of the guilt, but she was just assuaged by saying, that's not who we are. But that's not who you are, bro. How high a price are you willing to pay for success? Wendy and I rode that particular horse into the ground when talking about mahogany, because when Tracy Chambers follows Sean McAvoy to Rome, and not quite overnight, becomes a worldwide runway sensation, she seems to get that, like it or not, hard work or not, sometimes that means paying the toll to your mentor, or benefactor in sexual terms, or at least being willing to. But once Tracy's attempt to pay Sean McAvoy back for his career boost ends with a whimper and not a bang, those fashion shoots and runway shows and charity auctions in Italy get really ugly really fast. And Tracy suddenly remembers that she wanted to be a designer like Halston, not a professional clothes hanger, as she puts it, like Lauren Hutton. Note to self, never put all your professional and personal eggs in Anthony Perkins' basket. And don't let anyone call you out of your name, especially if his name rhymes with Lion Beecrest. You know, the very next scene, she flounces in, um, and she's got, I don't even know, there's some, like, connect for kind of stuff going on at her collar. Mm -hmm. And Sean says to her, that's not what you're supposed to be wearing. And she says, well, I thought it's time for me to show off my own designs. And I thought, bitch, what? Like, you're a model. You're there to to show off somebody else's designs. And it was the one time, again, watching it as an older adult woman Mm -hmm. going, "Mm -mm." And I thought, you know, when I saw this movie before, I was like, he's immediately terrible to her after Mm -hmm. he can't get it up. right. But he's terrible to her immediately because she forgets what she's there for. And she's not doing the job she was hired for. But she also is like, you couldn't get up. I tried to pay you back. Now it's time to get my shit. That's what I'm saying. Like, the timing was incredible where she was like, I got to make it on my own. You know, I got to build something that doesn't involve your crazy ass. And I was just like, "Mm, Tracy, Mm -hmm. Tracy, girl. But she was right. And then the crazy thing was that auction. That auction that was for the poor children in Italy. She brought her own. That was totally not one? white. What did they describe it as white? It was um, a simple silk white jumpsuit. White. Yeah. And she stalks out in this peach bedazzled kimono <laughs> monstrosity. She's obsessed with the. I was thinking it was um, everybody was come to fight it. Oh, it was all I mean, of she that. She did this like even when she was laughing at something, and she was like, "Ha ha!" Like not modeling. I'm doing the karate chop hand. I think she thought she was modeling though. No, like, no, no. This is no. She was doing that on on stage mm-hmm. and doing modeling. But there was a scene, and I can't remember. I think she was with Billy Dee, and she's laughing, or whatever, and she goes, "Ha ha ha!" Or dancing when she was dancing Girl. at the party, and at first she was like, and I was like, I guess that song must have been out because you know, we were loving some martial arts, our people in the seventies. So look, Wendy, I'm just gonna confess, I have that song on <laughs> my phone, and it gets played on the I regular. Love it, <laughs> just, you know, every brother thought he could do. Oh yeah, I got a brown belt. You know, oh. I got a purple belt, even though there isn't one. You know, like. <laughs> I think Sean had the purple belt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he had a rainbow belt. He had a rainbow belt. It's so, oh, God. But, yeah, that show was just so embarrassing. And 
you know, it's Italy. Like, they just felt like, I'm just going to let loose because she bitch going crazy, going crazy on the runway. But who started it all? Anthony Perkins. He did. 500 lira. Oh. 500 lira. Okay. I <laughs> love the way she gave him the black woman look like, all right, bitch, I'm going to still go out here like I'm fabulous. <laughs> Like, she had balls. She, just amazing, and I love them. Even when I was like, girl, you know, that's I not know, right. I know. It's not right. But, yeah, and then Christian saves her by buying it. That's. And she just, again, it's just, it just really, this facts. whole movie is all about, like, what you have to do for success and what success really means. And it's just heartbreaking in so many ways. Like, she's just at the pinnacle of her career, and it's just nothing. But to go back a little, I got a little salty where she gets to Italy. She goes over to Sean's place. He lets her in, and he's showing her all his beautiful things, right? All these models that he's created. He objectifies them. Right, on his wall. And he says, you know, I name all Mm -hmm. of my things. And she's like, bitch, I got a name. Mm -hmm. It's Tracy. Um, and he says, no, I think... He said, I rename all my pretty things. And what does he say? Something like... You're brown. And he something, said, something. brown. And he said... Rich. I give all my creations the names of inanimate objects. Yeah. And mahogany's mm-hmm. wood, right? Which he doesn't have. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he says, there's <laughs> only one word to describe something that's beautiful and rich and rare. And dark. Rich. So, yeah. And I'm going to call you mahogany. And she's like, mm, I don't think I like yeah. it. And I'm just going to say, I don't really truck with this whole white folks renaming brown folks right. thing. Like, well, but they made it clear that he renamed white people. That's I know. How they got over but that. still, and I feel I like. I just don't like people renaming people. It's or women. Just, it's, yeah, yeah, there's just something really wrong. Like, I'm still mad at Ryan Seacrest. I'm going to kick him down mm, a flight of stairs. Because right. a couple years ago when, you remember a little, uh. Kavaj and A. Wallace yeah. was nominated for an Oscar and he nobody like white people just felt like I can't pronounce yeah, that and I'm not yeah. going to. Mm-hmm. And he said, I'm I just gonna call black you. people are worse about that. No, I'm sorry. I know. I'm not saying, just, I know my people. But they'll get to it eventually. Mm, like, they be like, that little girl who was in Annie and then that other movie about like the poor people was it in New Orleans? I don't remember. But when mm-hmm. it's your job though, that's my thing. Like yeah. he was like, I'm just gonna call you a little Q. And Is she that what was he said? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, like she's a rapper, you know? And Ooh. she said, my name is Kravash. Oh, I know. That's right. Right? Good. And it's just like... She should have called him Bob. Right? <laughs> I mean, I watched this again, and I was like, maybe I need to be Mahogany Jones. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's a fierce name. I love that. I know. I was like, it's not too late. Ooh. It's not too late to like morph. That has a really good ring swivel, to it too. Doesn't it? So, well, that could be your alter ego. Like, we all need that. I've been hearing that same crap from you ever since we met. Where the hell did you come here anyway? See, the girl named Tracy James. I guess I just found a different person. You sure did. You know what you found? You found a success, Brian. I'm a success. And you can't stand it. Me! Mahogany! Well, you may think you're a success, baby, but, uh, you're all alone. Are you kidding? Did you see those people? They love me. They all love me. The men love me. The women love me. Mahogany. They don't love you. They love some kind of cartoon character that madman made up in his sleep. Freak of the month! That's what they love. Freak. Tracy, look, if you stay here, you're in for a lot of trouble. The only trouble I've ever had, Brian, is from you. You come limping over here saying, Tracy, I love you. I need you. (laughs) Sure you need me. You want to know why? Because I'm a winner. I'm a winner, baby. These people love me. And you can't stand it because nobody loves you. I hear it's lonely at the top, but sadly, I wouldn't quite know 
I mean, I've seen The Devil Wears Prada, Funny Face, and Zoolander, maybe that last one twice. I know love ends, even when your stylist and your makeup are on fleek. But Wendy and I couldn't get over how isolated Tracy, excuse me, she's mahogany now, is once she's a supermodel. But also when she was a department store secretary and a struggling fashion student back in Chicago. That loneliness goes away for a little bit when Billy D. Williams' Brian decides to surprise Tracy slash Mahogany a year later by showing up on her doorstep in Rome. It took him over a year to do it, but it was right on time for Tracy, if not Sean. But Billy D. Williams' swag was clearly too much for both of them because after the lovers spend time canoodling in the streets of Rome, hijinks ensue. Brian doesn't know what this heifer mahogany did with his girl Tracy. Tracy wants some props for her hard-won success, and she doesn't want to go back to Chicago. And Sean just wants Brian to get the hell away from mahogany. A homoerotic gunfight, some painful candle wax drippings, and a broken heart or two may or may not be involved. You could tell the director is a black man because the black male sexuality and the prowess of the black man. He is it's so pronounced. Particularly how the scene is set up right after the impotence. And mm-hmm. then, bam, this this lion comes into Italy. And she leaps into his arms. I mean, he hasn't seen her in a year. And it is, like, on and popping. Mm-hmm. And it's evident. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, at the party, Anthony Perkins can't even handle it. It's like, oh, man, that's that nigga back here. <laughs> Well, that leads to... Right after I was completely emasculated. <laughs> Complete what that leads to the the gun, the gun scene. And it's that whole check off. If there's a gun, it has to go off. Yeah. Um, which it didn't when yeah. he was trying to get with right. Diana Ross. Right. You know, but that that scene is like really urgent and funny. Like and unintentionally crazy. funny. Like, I remember being crazy. a little like, what is going... And then the candle thing. I remember when I was little, I just did not get it. I always thought she was high on something. But then when I re saw it twice, life, Wendy. He, she pushes away the joint. <laughs> yeah. It's like per, right before that, it's like, mm-hmm. no, this is just, I'm snapping or whatever. It was I felt like she was acting out because Brian was there, someone that she loved, but he was basically like, yeah. this life is bullshit. Yeah. Which, you know, it I'm not going to lie, it kind of was. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, she was just kind of like leaning into it. Yeah. And she didn't know that somewhere in another room. Yeah. You know, her crazy... Right. Like, that's the thing. He never told her. He never told her what happened. That's interesting. It was very... It was... It killed me this time. And I remember being younger seeing it. Like, why aren't they explaining stuff to each other? Like, I just was so frustrated. this is why I feel like they weren't meant for each other. Like, Mm. huge things go unsaid. Yeah. You know? Like... Hey, um, this Bengali who created your career just tried to lay like, right. beat shoot and rape my mouth with a gun. Right. I'm out. Right. right. You know? Right. And but they never had the opportunity. See, he said, I waited for you. Now I'm waiting for a taxi. That indicated he wasn't leaving right away. He just had to leave the party. Mm-hmm. He waited for her. She didn't come back for hours. She comes back drunk. Which is just bad manners. You know, <laughs> right. And so, like, you didn't even chase me. You know, and we all want to be, like, I had a, <laughs> I had a bunch of clients at an unnamed law uh, school, mm-hmm. university. Mm-hmm. They were all mm-hmm. professors. And one storms out in the middle of us interviewing them, prepping for trial. She storms out, and we continue the meeting. And, like, about half an hour later, there's a knock on the door. She's like, I can't believe no one came after me. <laughs> and I'm like, that's that's an innate human thing, right? When you yeah. storm out, like, ain't nobody going to I know I ran away once, and nobody came, so I went back, you know? like. So you thought Brian was, like, waiting for her? Well, he said it. See, I never, he says, I was waiting for you for hours. Now I'm waiting for a taxi. Okay. That's right. But I mean. So that was it. So the, the opportunity for explanation. And that but happens he didn't in life storm sometimes. Out. He waited for her. Now he's waiting for a taxi. He could have been waited downstairs. He was waiting to say, bitch, yeah. you left me high and dry. Yeah. And I mean, out. he wanted the opportunity to talk. That's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. And she comes in drunk, which obviously is not the best time. And it ends up, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. And you love is nothing without somebody you share it with or whatever that famous line is. Yeah. So they never have, but that happens in life so often. 
it's but this never is twice sad. where she does not want those serious conversations yeah. with him. Like the whole movie, she's running from anything yeah. other than because she wants to get her dream. Being, yeah, and she knows the times are you get married and you have babies, and mm-hmm. she's trying not to get trapped up in that. Yeah, I thought it was progressive that at her age she had an apartment on her own. Well, let's when I was talk younger, about I thought she age. lived with her aunt. Well, first of all. Where is her aunt while she's in Italy? I know people yeah. didn't have cell phones back then. Yeah. And like it was you expensive to, to call to back home. Yeah. But you're an internationally famous model. Yeah. Where they can like flip through a magazine in Chicago and see your face yeah. on the regular. But you can't afford to call your aunt once. I she maybe did. I'm we saying never I assume s- she didn't. You know, but she just that the whole thing in Italy the movie further. Like that it probably got edited have. out. It just it just highlighted her loneliness. Like she didn't that have was the point. any friends. Right. She the, had no friends. It would have ruined that perspective of her to have called the aunt. Like that may have been calls. You're still lonely. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? My grandfather yeah. died. I was in Australia. I had friends. I talked to my mom every day. We cried. Mm-hmm. I was still lonely. Would you like to throw in a drink with me as part of the bargain? Mister, I've waited a long time for this night. This is my first sale. You can have whatever you want. Oh, I'll just take a drink for now. I'm Evie Jones, and you are still listening to No Tea for the Fever, bless your heart. And we're still talking about mahogany. Now, you know who else seems really lonely in mahogany? Christian, the wealthy Italian suitor who saves her from public humiliation when he bids roughly a zillion lira after Mahogany decides to hold a charity fashion show hostage by stomping out onto the runway, wearing her own design, her own wacky design. Christian also pops up conveniently in the movie's third act when he, without her permission, spirits her away from the hospital where she's bandaged and recovering from a batshit crazy car accident that was caused by a certain photographer. It's all good, though, because not only can Mahogany recover in Christian's luxurious Roman estate, but he agrees to bankroll the one thing she wants the most, her own fashion line. But only if she puts out when she's back on her feet, literally and figuratively. One word for this, ugh. No wonder Mahogany decided to chuck it all and go back to Chicago and be Tracy again. But with Christian, where, you know, she's gotten out of the hospital after that crazy okay. accident with Sean. Christian's the Italian French Christian guy. is the okay. Italian, but actually French guy. And first of all, that scene is bananas because she's out of the hospital and he says, she says, hey, how did I get out? And he says, oh, my grandfather owns the hospital. Yeah. And I was like, of course he did. And he's, she's in his Italian villa yeah. recuperating, jacked up, bandaged. Right she near can't her walk. house. Right. She's, on, she's just on the other side of the ruins, I think. Right, right. And I'm like, okay, you didn't ask her. You right. busted her out of the hospital. This is what I'm saying. Did she have that freedom there? Because now she's beholden to him. It was but so she hard for her to turn that down. Didn't she? Because... Of course she did. But that's, she's still giving up herself. And he's like, you would have done this. And she was like, but, you know, she's bandaged up and she says, you know, what do you want in return for, like, taking care of me? And he says, I think you know. Well, because earlier, she's right. like, I'll give you anything. He was like, oh. And she did not say, uh-uh. He was like, why don't it we start with a drink clear, for now? Yeah. And she was like, okay. But I'm like, can I, like, learn to walk again before we, like, you know, make our I mean, he made it very clear and she accepted it. Yes, yeah, like. So in a weird way, I kind of appreciated the clarity. Me too. It was it was amazing. Could I make those choices? I don't know, but I've learned that I cannot make. The, I've had I've seen some hard times where I could have like sexed my way out of yeah. it, and I was just like, "Well, I guess I'm gonna die slash starve." Right. Exactly. And I'm a little, frankly, disappointed in myself for my integrity. But like, that's what I'm saying. With that <laughs> integrity, this is what was set up eventually, mm-hmm. and. It was time to pay the piper. She ashamedly said, fine, you know, I said I was, this was the deal. And so where do you go from there? I feel like, where are these men where if I sleep with you eventually, you will give me my own, yeah. um, what is it, basically like design yeah. studio factory yeah. with staff. And he made it very clear, you they work for me, he said, remember? Well, that was the amazing scene where... 
she is screaming at the staff, yeah. which she thinks is hers because yes. her name is on the yes. company. So is she really leaving her dream? It's not her company. On paper, on it looks like her company. The contracts were all done up. Remember, he's like, oh, I'll take care of this. It's something else. <laughs> so is this really, does she have ownership of this? And is she always going to feel beholden to this man? I sure. just want to go home. Yeah, and I think that question never really dies. Like, I think right. that, like, I was reading um, Kerry Washington in Entertainment Weekly recently when she was talking about how, you know, Scandal did this tie-in with Banana Republic for a line of posts oh. from the show, which is done really well. I can't fit into any of them, so I can only watch from a distance. <laughs> right, right. But she remember she saw something where she was like, ooh, I don't love that ad, and they and it was her face. And they were just like, well, deal with it because right. you don't own that. Right. It's you from the show right. and we own that. And it's like just to know that you are wildly successful but you don't own your own face and Dude, body. Is... Yes, this is what I'm saying. So like it can, she may be, when she goes back, she may have to, she hit her dreams at some point that was beyond she anything she ever dreamed of, mm-hmm. right? It but was, it was a qualified dream because she wanted to be a designer. Exactly. She never wanted to be a model. So when she finally got to design, da da da, she still didn't own that shit. Mm-hmm. So she's like, okay, I want to go home. Mm-hmm. And maybe she just needs to be held and maybe she will work for this guy's campaign. Like, I don't know what the next mm-hmm. mahogany is. It would have been great because it could have been, okay, I may, you know, push down. I did that dream. I need to re convalesce. Like, my, my mental state, like mm-hmm. everything my pride, and who knows if she could come back as a mahogany in New York or Chicago. I would kind of, I would have loved that. Right. Like, I we really don't know would've... what happens. Like, I think it's interesting everyone assumes she gave up her dream. I was like, but did you see the dream? Did you see what it was? <laughs> At that point. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was not on her own terms, and he made it, and when he said, they were for me, mm-hmm. it was very clear, and now hey, let's get it on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah, right. I forgot. I got to pay that promissory note. He wants my ass. (laughs) And what am I giving up for? I I got the the name, but I don't own them. How do you like it here? I have my own apartment. You know that. I thought this would be more comfortable. What's the catch? What do you think? <laughs> she was basically a glorified kept woman. She was she he wanted her to become that. Mm-hmm. Either to one of these white men. Mm-hmm. And she felt like she owed them. You know, she already went through that with Anthony and straight said it to him, I owe you everything. Mm-hmm. She realizes at this show, like, yeah, I'm a success, this is just the beginning, but you're talking about the beginning of the the movie where and then at the end yeah when it comes back to that mm-hmm. the dream and and she's like okay because in the beginning when I saw it this most recent time because the last time I saw it I missed the beginning mm-hmm. like I just caught it on TV mm-hmm. so when I saw the beginning I was like wait so she did make it like I totally forgot that so at the end when she's back to that it's like well wait I just want to go home do you know what I mean like yeah I totally I don't felt own that. this. Because there was nobody waiting for her behind yeah. the curtain except her agent. Or And then this man is going to, the promissory notes do again. You know, what I really hate about that whole thing is that I really appreciated him going, I don't want it like this. No, it's true. But I hate he... that I have to give him props for going, that was really jacked up for me to like make this, a con- like you're, you giving to yourself to me sexually a condition of... Mm-hmm. Me like helping you, like he, he was just like I don't. But want he wasn't of this. that feeling bad till he actually said tested to see if she would do it. And because he made he tested, but a lot of men shit, would that it would be like. Would and be now I'm dropping my you know I agree. Trousers. But I'm saying from Tracy's point of view, if you really were being benevolent to me, you would have never tried to cash in on that note until I hit on you. Yeah. It's true. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But you tested the waters, and I was like, oh, now he's playing fucking games. He's playing fucking games. He wanted to put her in her place after she acted out. And he keeps putting her in her place. Yeah. But this was the moment she wasn't acting out. Mm-hmm. She had a wonderful show. It was all success. Now it's time. Mm-hmm. No, in my bedroom. Remember? And what is... 
Can I forget? See what I'm saying? So that, to me, I was like, so what are these women talking about? Like, no. Right. This was not a good situation back in Italy, even though he said oh, never I mind. I never thought it was. Yeah. No, oh, I don't know about you. I'm just yeah, saying. Like, just, yeah. Just. Yeah. Just the absolute worst. And again, go, like, I when I see stuff like this in real life, in movies, like, I am so grateful that I've just survived life because I've been mm-hmm. in that scenario many a time and I've gone, I think I'm just going to die or not Well, eat. I've never been in that situation. Yeah. At this stage, I'm I mean, nobody was offering me it. my own passion like, line. At this stage, I don't know if I was mine. <laughs> Love it's is, like, you know, what's love got to do with it? Not that you got insurance, you got good benefits. Making like a clothes hanger seems like a silly way to earn a living to me. <laughs> what are you, Miss Chambers, an underachiever? No, I'm an achiever, all right. It's just that I'd rather do it by making clothes, not by wearing them. Did you make that? Yes, I did. Me and my tailoring department right here. Well, I'm impressed. Thank you. You've impressed me. Thank you. What are you going to do with it? I'm going to sell it. This and a whole collection more. In Chicago? What's wrong with Chicago? Nothing. Nothing but a trip to Europe wouldn't cure. <laughs> this is a long way from Europe. Don't I know it? You'd love it in, in Rome. And why is that? Because in Rome, Miss Chambers, they don't send their pretty things out to get coffee. As much as Billy D. Williams Bryan puts down the fashion industry, especially the poverty porn aspect of so many editorial spreads, Tracy doesn't seem to have much respect for it either, at least not when it comes to modeling. It seems bizarre to think that someone would supermodel their way into becoming a designer, but as someone a long way from both Chicago and Milan once said, you gotta dance with them with Brunya. But Brian and Tracy are no strangers to hard work and hustle, something they have in common with the film's director and Diana Ross's once secret lover, Barry Gordy. Remember when that was like the secret of the century? Wendy and I went there and everywhere, touching on Ross's most underrated role, whether Beyonce bit mahogany style and the dotted line that connects Barry Gordy and mahogany to, wait for it, straight out of Compton. Yes, seriously, get into it. But back to the fashion. But okay, so he, Billy D's character, down degrades fashion, like the industry, like it's not worthy. Completely. But, and then she kind of does too. Because she keeps saying, she downgrades it on another, like the lowest ones I always find are actors and models, you know, Mm -hmm. out of all the other people. Mm -hmm. They get shot upon the worst. They're the dumb ones. They don't get asked their opinions. They get like slave auction, you know. Mm -hmm. Let me see your teeth. Let me see you. (laughs) Um, But she also says coat hanger and then she puts down modeling. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's funny. It's interesting to me. I, yeah. I mean, she's so ambivalent. She, yeah, she just loves parts of it. Like she wants to be creative and she doesn't think modeling is Uh creative. Uh And that's an argument that's still being made frequently by models. And she doesn't want to be in the sweatshop like her aunt. Clearly. I think that's maybe why she doesn't really know how to sew. That's She was like, I'm going to farm yeah. that shit out. I mean, and that's a practice. <laughs> you know, that's an art. Right. So that, that I don't do the home thing. I'm not a crafty person, but mm-hmm. I have design. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I loved when, um, you know, like you were saying about their first date, just I cannot get over just the, the chillness of her time together. Yeah. With Brian slash Billy D. Williams, yeah, like yeah. I just feel like I never see that, even in any, you know. They had an amazing chemistry, like mm-hmm. even uh, Lady Day, a lady, Lady Blues. Blues. I mm-hmm. keep thinking of Lady Day, Emerson Burn Girl. Um, but yeah, she was just they together were even the way it was so genuine. Like when he put the nickels in the door the second Italy. Mm-hmm. And then she's like, oh, my God, like, and jumped in. I mean, it was so, like, real to me. I know. If I were Barry Gordy, I would be like, wait a minute. Like, I would be jealous. I feel, I in my mind, I feel like Barry and Billy had a little talk where, like, you know, Barry just happened to have a gun sticking out of his coat. Right. And was, like, directing him. And she was like, and you got a family at home, so step the hell off. Let's make this movie amazing. <laughs> but that chemistry, they were on fire from from jump. I felt like their chemistry was... It was just off. 
the charts. Because I can't believe they only made two movies. I'm still like, to me, they're like Poitier and um, Cosby in those movies together. Mm. Pryor and Gene Wilder, like, I felt like they made tons of movies together because they were so good when they did it. You know, but I feel like, you know, and you kind of alluded to earlier, like, Diana had her taste of acting. I actually think she did a movie that I need to Google and find out, but it was basically about mental illness. I think her character was bipolar. And she was absolutely amazing. I'm going to look it up because you should definitely see it. Um, And I feel like if people had seen this, she would get so much more props Props that she deserves, because mm-hmm. she tore it up. I thought she was actually excellent in Billie Holiday. I didn't get the casting of it. But Out of Darkness. Like, Out of Darkness. Yeah. Phone yeah. <laughs> Diana was in this. I think it was an ABC movie. I'm pretty sure it was oh, a okay, telemovie. Okay, okay. Um, it was called Out of Darkness. And okay, she was a pre-med student, which blew my mind a little bit. Right. Um, and she develops schizophrenia. She becomes this paranoid yeah. schizophrenic, and she has a child. And the movie blew me away because you almost never see any movies about people right. dealing with mental illness, and they're certainly Plus not black. black people. You yeah. never see black people as dealing med with students. It. <laughs> as med students, and I've known quite a few in school who lost their minds. Yeah, and it's she is absolutely incredible in this, and it makes it. I feel like it's a hate crime that nobody saw. Right. This. Because it's beautiful and perfect. And there's this amazing scene where she starts taking medication and she's on, you know, going through therapy and is trying to get better. And she's just sitting in the park. And I give props to her and the writer and director because you can see her, like, almost kind of normalizing. Mm. Like, in the course of, like, two minutes, mm. she's just becoming, slowly realizing that she's not schizophrenic in that moment she's seeing the world as it really is okay. and it like makes you cry it's so beautiful and mm. she's so perfect in this mm. so well that's the other thing to me the acting I felt like nobody overacted because mm. there are people who will fight you over it who love this movie because they feel like everybody overacted I don't feel like they did like I really feel like there was genuine moments like the dating scenes the um even the heartbreaking scene when she leaves Billy D and she's in the campaign office with the campaign worker, I forget his name, but um, and he's like, well, do you love him? Well, that's what I'll tell him. Mm-hmm. And they hug. And I was just like, oh, my God. Like, it was so sincere to me. I don't, I didn't, I didn't see they were acting. I think any time a movie is about the entertainment industry, it's always accused of being too yeah. much and over the top. I think the mood, well, the fashion, I mean, things, but the fashion, fashion is, is definitely over the, over the top. top, but it's, oh, that's its fashion. There was a lady in the audience with a blue Afro wig. I was like, whoa, at the fashion show. That is fashion's job, as far as I'm concerned, to be over the top right. or, and to make you watch an eyebrow go, I'm sorry, what? Well, and that's haute couture. Like, yeah. It's a, it's not like she wasn't doing, J- she fair. wasn't doing like JC Penny. Right, you right. You know, and that's a different kind of model. I just felt like these critiques were from such a heterosexual white male perspective. Yeah, all of those things. All of those things. Um, like they couldn't accept us doing this stuff. Flying back and forth to Italy, which she didn't even do back and forth. She went out once and then came back and he flew her out. But there's just a resentment of how do you get to do this thing that mm. I, as a white person and a man, am mm. not even doing, you know. Or I just don't see it as black people. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think I was talking to you um, when I was working on the book and I was writing about mahogany and um, I was telling some friends and acquaintances who asked about it how it is filtered down through pop culture. Mm-hmm. And I think around that time, that's when um, Dream Girls had come out, okay. the remake. And I was saying that, that Beyonce mm-hmm. does, you know, there's mm-hmm. a montage that is bananas in there and beautiful and I love right, it. Right. And I was saying that's a complete totally, yeah. bite ripoff yeah. of this scene in Mahogany. Well, it's not a ripoff. It's telling the it's story an of her. <laughs> yeah, but maybe that was Diana Ross fighting for this role mm-hmm. and finding to be the costume person on the role, fighting Barry Gordy to do that. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know, because he'd be like, just focus on the song that we're going to play a hundred times and act in it. <laughs> She's like, no, because she went to school for it. So yeah. she's like, I want to get my designs out there. Mm-hmm. Like, who knows? Mm-hmm. But that montage is fantastic yeah. because for just because it exists in the yes, world. Like, yes. she is, like, wrangling butterflies. Yes, yes. Oh, that was 
and she right i like that i just she is cleopatra and she's laughing and she's kicking i I just didn't find i don't know there was the the center they were patient and they must have had a lot of money because they caught some moments that i said probably weren't scripted Buongiorno, signore. Camareri? Buongiorno, signorina. Che bello rivederlo oggi. Rivelioli oggi? Sì, signore. Um, uh, un di vino bianco, per favore. What do you want, lady? Some wine? Sì, sì, signore. Okay, fine. Okay. Bene, bene. Molto okay, grazie. Grazie. I also feel like when I look at... um you know, reviews and clips and, you know, retrospectives, because this movie is 41 years old now, oh which God. I know, right? No wonder I didn't. I wasn't born yet when it was in the movies. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that's how old we are. Like, it is 41 years Holy old, cat. and it is still, like, at the top of people's yeah, minds when yeah. I talk about it. That's why I was like, oh, it, this has to be the first one. Um, but, oh, God, what was I going to say? Oh, peep, I feel like when I read the reviews, people are really, there's something really dismissive about the Barry Gordy took over directing, yeah. so he could do whatever the fuck he wanted. I think he did a really good job. And I'm like, he's fucking Barry Gordy. It's like, <laughs> last night I saw um, Straight Outta Compton. Mm-hmm. Bootleggy. But uh, it was so good, and I was like, damn, that was 30 years. Like, I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. But the audacity of the, did you see it? Mm -hmm. The audacity of I these I just saw boys. it, and I just read the script. Really? Yeah. Oh. And I just was with my mom, and I'm like, wow, because she keeps like, just go do your dream. Just go out and do it. Just keep, even if they don't hire you, just go do, you know, um, whatever you want to do, just go do it. And... I'm like, the reality is it's hard, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, who was calling me on Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> Your face? <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Um, so, but the way those boys just, like, it was, I said, that was just kismet, God, whatever. But, like, how the three of them came together. And I said, Ice Cube and Dr. Dre were geniuses. Easy mm -hmm. E was a business guy. Mm -hmm. He got caught up with that white guy. But still, he they had a... He had a ballsiness to even his drug dealing. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know where your mama lives. Like, that first scene, like, he's quick with getting out of situation. They need that. Mm -hmm. Oh, you looking for Felicia? Come on. <laughs> you know, I was like, they worked together. The three of them together was, like, perfection for a minute and got them where they needed to go so that they could all do their Ice Cube with his movies, mm -hmm. Dr. Dre with his, uh, well, his musical intellect, but also his other, the beats. Mm -hmm. and, um, what else did Dr. Dre, oh. His clothing line, right, based on the prison, which was crazy, but state state property. Um, anyway, they it's were good they got enough going on, and we have to think they, about I it. I know, <laughs> but really, like how these two guys just had nothing and just went out and pushed and did it and mm -hmm. believed in themselves mm -hmm. enough. Even when Ice Cube was like, you know what, I'd rather be poor than sign this contract. Yes, Ex that that's all I'm saying. I mean, it was just, and how his writing, because I don't know if I fully appreciated it in AA when they first came out. I know I did not. I was more I of an East Coast more, person, mm -hmm. you know, like, I like the East Coast rap, I like Public Enemy, I didn't realize they are saying the same thing, just mm -hmm. with a whole lot more curse words mm -hmm. and stuff, or BDP, mm -hmm. you know, I love BDP, I love, I, I couldn't get over the, the curse words and a lot of other stuff, um, mm -hmm. With N.W.A. Yeah. I mean, I, I enjoyed some of the songs, but I realized through the movie, I was like, I really don't know. What. But they're brilliantly written. Yeah, they really are. I mean, I couldn't, the cursing I could get past, I couldn't get past the let's throw this bitch down the stairs. Yeah, exactly. Of it all. That's exactly. And that's a big leap, I think, to ask yeah. me to make. Right. You Especially know? at that age. Like, that was when I'm just finding my own stuff and not, you know. Right. I just, but the, but I really, what I was going to say is, um, the, how, how some people, because it made me think about Motown. Like, this, they were like the Motown of West Coast rap. Yeah. Out of them came everybody. Mm -hmm. No matter which iteration it was. Right. Whether it was Aftermath of, you know, the, the one they started out under, Bone Thugs and Army came out of <laughs> Easy e You know, so I was like, dang. Yeah, there was a whole, whole bunch of people. There's a whole family tree to be drawn yes. from that. That continues to this day. Yes. And I feel like the respect isn't there, like, and there's now, decades later, like, begrudging respect for Barry Gordy. Like, there was some men. But, yeah. But it was still, like, mm. So he killed it in mm -hmm. the music industry. He's like, no, nah, I'm gonna go make a movie. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, no, 
this is not what I want. I'm going to just do it. Yeah. That's Ice Cube when he's sitting there writing and his wife goes, how's the movie? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm at page 100. It's pretty funny. <laughs> now, we just talked about projects we want to do. Have I done it? No. Right, And right. I have so many opportunities. Right. Now. Like, maybe that's a problem, but it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. I mean, when I think about stuff like that, there's a lot of invisible support. Mm -hmm. Like, because I keep trying to, like, reverse engineer, like, the difference between me and people who've, like, managed mm -hmm. to do it mm -hmm. successfully, unsuccessfully, mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. in between. And, you know, not to make excuses, but there's a lot of, and I mean a lot, it's not just one person hooking you up, mm -hmm. but w even these people that I think of as, like, one man bands, one woman bands. There were people going, oh, let me get your groceries for that week. Mm -hmm. Oh, why don't you stay with my cousin? Yes. You know, oh, why don't, I know you don't have a job right now. Yes. You know, why and don't you walk my dogs? You know. But the sacrifices, like mm -hmm. he had to live in a single bed and that's what his wife was, or girlfriend with the baby was like, I'm out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that's a whole other discussion. Mm -hmm. Like when you're like, my art trumps this. Um, or God takes it away from me. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I gotta, he had no other options. I, yeah. I think, you know, these are guys who just, I don't know, I just was like, wow, that they, the mod or when um, in that documentary, Nina's daughter calls her father, like, that was one of the first puppies. Like, he just was like, no, we need to get your music out. We mm -hmm. need people to hear you, blah, blah, blah. His other fault aside. Um, <laughs> you know, and I thought, that's funny how people just will say, believe in this yeah. you or, or somebody else they see and say, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to put my eggs in that basket. Yeah, I mean, watching this again years later, like, there's a part of me that feels like, what else could Barry, I mean, Barry could have, I'm really interested to see what other kind of movies he would have made. Right. And Did maybe. He, he didn't do any others? Not that I'm aware of. Maybe he produced them, like the way Yeah, right? yeah, definitely. But I thought he was a good director. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was kind of impressed with this They were job. like, is it a travel log? One of those. I was like, there was a setting of... the scene to me, the way he set up the whole could be rape scene and the darkness. And I was like, wow, they mm -hmm. really went in for it. And then they showed the openness of Italy and like, and she's I like, we're incredible. drinking coffee, looking at the ruins. We call that the ghetto back, <laughs> you know, I mean. There are not many volumes on the book show, if you get my meaning. Yes, but the smile. She is... We're selling perfume, not denture cream, Michelangelo. Personally, for myself, I find that Sinirina Mahogany's assets are something more significant than a pair of uh, silicone lobes. Yes, but we all know that you're not a bread man, don't we, Giuseppe? <laughs> well, who are we selling this perfume to in the first place? Weightlifters? Last year, I watched Mahogany again with a gay white male friend who was eager to see it for the first time. As soon as Anthony Perkins turned up on screen in that department store, he looked at me and said, I can see this is going to end in sequins and tears. Now, I'm pretty sure that comment won't win any GLAAD awards, and Mahogany probably wouldn't either, then or now. But Wendy and I were struck by how, to us at least, nuanced and painfully honest the depictions of sexuality and desire were straight, secretly gay, interracial, transactional, loving, consensual, kind of coerced. This was a mainstream movie, and for 1975, they covered a lot of ground between Ross's costume changes. You know, I've definitely run into a lot of white gay men who appreciate this movie, and mm -hmm. some of them broadly, like not just for its camp elements. Um, but this movie still says a lot to me, like, and I take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Um while still loving it and still rolling my eyes at some parts of it, the yeah, way you yeah. do people that you love. Because, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know. Um, and it's brutally honest about sexual love. Sexual, like, the, to have Anthony Perkins' character and then to have him not get it up, and I'm like, whoa, like, wow, would we have dealt with this that way nowadays? Well, it's interesting because, you know, it kind of mirrors, like, Anthony Perkins, his own sexual, yeah, yeah. you know, stuff that yeah. I think was... I didn't about know about it then. until the reviews. Yeah, apparently it was. It was a thing reviews. even then. Oh, was that? No, that was a current review. That was a modern review retro. Right. And then he's older and, you know, you've got psycho infusing mm -hmm. your perception. You're like, Anthony Perkins yes, is in this? He is, but that's the... 
And they're like, oh, he got Miss Daddy played that. I'm like, that's what happens with actors, though. If you play the hell out of a quirky role, you're going to keep getting them. Exactly. But I also think, like, it's an interesting take on sexuality that's only just starting to happen where he's clearly drawn to her Mm -hmm. and not just in a, you know, I made you kind of way. But, you know, they kind of, there's only, you know, the movie's two hours long. There's only Mm -hmm. so much they can do. But, and he was clearly crazy yeah. as evidenced by that yeah. insane yeah. you know car crash yeah yeah well yeah the gun, the gun. yeah and, and the even crash. the opening when the object crystal and she's like so what's that about i was like that was a big red flag all the darts in her face <laughs> he's like even though you're getting older you don't get mature i'm like yeah oh, that was a that was a hint honey <laughs> he had he was sending up so many red flags was so it was good. like nascar that just character like, was awesome I love that character. But, you know, they were definitely trying to say something about, like... And him saying, being a sissy, carrying a bag. And then yeah. she's like, well, now you sound like a sissy. Right. And then Giuseppe. Mm-hmm. When Giuseppe... Now, it's funny, I remember his character, because I don't know his real name, probably. But I love Giuseppe. But <laughs> Giuseppe, um, he seems like a modern-day, like, uh, Sex in the City, the gay friend character. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. uh, you don't... I don't see those in movies back then, too often, yeah. where they actually said it. Because he's like... Well, she's this. He's trying to defend her, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Well, obviously, we know you don't like. You're not a breast man. Yeah, you know? yeah. You don't like the globes or whatever they told him. Right. And so right. it's like, whoa, they just put it out. I there. just snapped. I know my head went what? Yeah, yeah. Swivel. I kind of with the honesty of it and saying they call it a ghetto, like the brutal gay black honesty mm-hmm. of how we talk in house and maybe not out house. Mm-hmm. It's just great. When a man has everything in the world that he wants, except what he wants most. He loses his self-respect. It makes him bitter, Laura. He wants to hurt someone as he's been hurt. I was thinking of, there's this movie called Laura that I love, where that's decades younger than this, but still famous. Partly, again, because of its theme song. I don't know. Um, But there is a character whose name is Waldo Lidecker. <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> Which I think should be a clue to his okay. orientation, yeah, yeah. perhaps. And he's famous. Or and he's he, a dandy. He's a da- he's definitely a dandy. Okay. He's even got a walking cane. Okay, walking okay, stick perfect. That's like carved ebony. Yeah. And, uh, of course. And he <laughs> creates this young woman named Laura. Like, he builds her up from nothing. So there's this parallel between his character and Anthony Perkins' mm. character. But he is in love with her, but he is mm-hmm. also clearly gay mm-hmm. and clearly struggling with that dichotomy. Like, how does this work? And mm-hmm. that you know, she's, a lot, though. Yeah. Like, if I could attract straight men the way I attract gay men, it's ridiculous. Yeah, but, you know, I there's. Be me. <laughs> I finally told him, I was like, you just like my breasts because you want them. I, one of my first jobs at the White Dog Cafe, mm-hmm. one of the chefs blatantly said that to me. Mm-hmm. And. Our daily banter was, how are your breasts? Right. I remember one day I said, cancerous. Right. Oh, God. You don't know, say that. Like, just, just shut it down. And he was just like, okay, and now I can go to work. Right, right. That's so <laughs> funny. It's like, whatever works for you, boo. Yeah. Um, but again, that's sexuality. Because like we were talking about Bruce Jenner last night. We had dinner with a younger cousin. I'm sorry. I think it's Caitlin. Yeah, now. I'm sorry. But Apparently, he asked about Bruce Jenner. Yes. My, oh, my couple, oh, mm-hmm. Well, he's my cousin. He's my mom's first cousin. Mm-hmm. So they're older 70s, and my cousin is early 20s and me. And, you know, my mom was just like, okay. Because she's very open. You mm-hmm. know, she doesn't care about sexuality. But she's like, that's why I just don't get it. She's <laughs> like, okay, he turns into a woman, but he's still attracted to women. I don't get it. I'm like, but mom, DNA is we're all so different. So why do we not accept sexuality can can be different mm-hmm. amongst every or marriages when people mm-hmm. I'm like, you know, people are like I can't believe they live in separate rooms or they live in separate states. I'm like, why can't that marriage work for them? Yeah, and other marriage work for somebody else. Like, yeah, if you like threesomes and you marry somebody who likes them, that that, that sounds like a good ass marriage. Yeah, I mean, I think is it happy? Is anybody being hurt? You know, right. like those two things are you know the answer is yes and no. Right. Who are right. we to? So Anthony Perkins was he struggling? I mean, maybe he was bisexual. I don't know. I but you know again you know that line where she says you don't have to prove anything to me and that just sets him off. Yeah, he immediately starts ripping off her clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, 
I wish there was a space back then to say, I really want you and I have some, you know, yeah. it's sexual, but I can't have sex with you. Like, right. I mean, there's no story there, right. maybe. Like, maybe and you don't drive then, off an nowadays. Italian expressway. Sean, the car's moving. So what? The car's moving! I'm taking the pictures, okay? You're right. I'm not, but then I'm taking the pictures. What's the matter with you? Are you crazy? Well, clearly we could have talked about mahogany forever, and we almost did. Wendy in particular had so many questions, but in the end, she was just left with one. Where did you come up with the name of this podcast? Girl. Well, I stole it. I stole it. I mean... (laughs) But that's a story for another time because we are running unfashionably late. Thanks so much for listening to the Mahogany episode of No Tea for the Fever, which was produced by me, Evie Jones. Funding for this week's episode was made possible by my day job at an Ivy League university that shall remain nameless. A thousand and one Manolo Blahniks to one of my favorite people, the amazing lawyer, actor, and all-around badass Wendy Staten. And special thanks to filmmaker Tyler Perry, who was unable to call in this week as promised after tripping over some gaffer's tape on the set of Medea Goes to Fashion Week. We'll get you next time, boo. Don't forget to add No Tea for the Fever to iTunes, SoundCloud, or your favorite RSS feed. If you too could talk about mahogany forever, you can continue the conversation with us online at noteaforthefever.com or on Twitter at No Tea Fever. I give all my creations the names of inanimate objects. And what are you going to call me? Coat hanger? No, there's only one word that describes rich, dark, beautiful, and rare. I'm going to call you... Mahogany. Mahogany? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I like it. Well, you'll be the only one that doesn't by the time I'm through.